It is good to be in God's house. I'm thankful for all that God has done for us and all that God uh, is continuing to do uh, for us. We've been studying through the book of Ephesians. Uh, started on Wednesday nights and we kind of extended it uh, through, uh, into Sundays as well. And there'll be probably, I'm sure, the times when we'll break off um, from it for a, a moment or two, a week or two. But uh, it, it's, it's just been, it's a bit, been a blessing to me. Uh, we looked in the first part of Ephesians chapter 1 at the, the will of God, the work of the Savior, and the witness of the Holy Spirit uh, in salvation. Uh, Paul was talking to the church of, uh, at Ephesus, the saints, uh, those who were faithful, he says there in verse 1, about, about their standing in Christ and how they had been made to be accepted. Uh, we're, we're not acceptable the way that we are. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. God loves you the way that you are, but we're not acceptable the way that we are. Uh, we are outside of Christ. We're lost. We're dead in our sins and in, the, in our trespasses. We, we are unholy. We are unworthy of any and all that God has done. But in his mercy and in his grace, he sent Jesus to die on the cross and to be the, the payment for our sins. The Bible says that we are, we are made to be, that, that we are made to be uh, accepted. We are justified through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm glad that I stand before God today uh, righteous, not in my own righteousness, but in Christ's righteousness. I'm accepted. I'm acceptable. In fact, the Bible says that, that, I, that I become a son, and as a son of God, I, I have received the inheritance. Uh, the, there's, it's not just salvation uh, as, a, as a ticket to heaven. Sometimes we think the, the world thinks like that. Sometimes even Christians think like that. And I, I, I just want to get us beyond that. That salvation isn't just about some future home in heaven that we hope is going to be there the, to avoid hell. Salvation is right now there are blessings that God is working in our lives. There, the, there's an inheritance that we have the, 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 the beginning, the sealing, according to, to Ephesians chapter 1, uh, the sealing of the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. God has begun a good work in us. And that, that seal means that he has placed a stamp upon us, which means that we are the child of God. And that, that stamp cannot be taken away from us. How many of you like to go shopping? All the women's hands go up. And all the men's hands go down. Unless you're talking about guns or tools or something like that. How many of you shop for tools? How many of you would like to buy something that said craftsman on it? What if it said, what if it said, uh, uh, what if it said uh, John Deere? <laughs> some of you like John Deere, some of you don't like John Deere. Uh, uh, th th those are stamps, those, those are labels that have been placed upon it. You know that that, that that was the creator of those things. I don't know much about fashion. Uh, uh, maybe Coach, some, for, for some of you ladies. Other ladies like Coach. Um, I don't know anything else. I couldn't name another brand, uh, brand for purses or anything like that if I tried, if my life, if my life depended upon it. But those are labels. Have you ever seen something that came off that was that had a... It kind of looked like that, but wasn't quite the same. The, the stitching was off. The it, it didn't. It, it, instead of saying Rolex, it says Rotex. Right? What's what's the wrong, what's wrong with that? You know that it doesn't it, it, it doesn't have all that a Rolex would have. It isn't worth what a Rolex is worth. It's a fake. It's an imitation. It's it's a knockoff. There are too many Christians that are. In Christ. There are too many Christians that are, they just want the home in heaven. They're, they're satisfied with, uh, they're satisfied with, the, the, they think they've got to get out of hell free card. We need to be careful about that. Amen? Uh, now, now, Paul was writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. And, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that those people are necessarily lost, but those people are earthly minded. Those people, their, their mind is on this earth, and they're not really thinking about, uh, uh, about what, what God can do here, what God would do in them. And listen, uh, God has, has, here, look at Ephesians chapter 1. We haven't even gotten even close to the message yet. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, says, And as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God has chosen us to, to be holy and without blame here on this earth as well as in heaven. 
Now, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not holy yet. But I'm to strive to be holy. God has sealed me. He's put his stamp upon me. And I want, I want to represent that seal well. I want to be the, the greatest child of God. I want to be the praise to his glory. Another phrase that Paul uses several times. I want people to look at me and they want, I glorify the work of God in me when they see me. Because in the end, uh, I'm to be the praise of his glory now. One day I will be the praise, of, the praise of his glory when I get to heaven and he has finished his work in me. Philippians says it like this, he which has begun a, work, a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There will be a day when we see Christ and we'll, we, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. We'll be in heaven. You know what that day is? First Corinthians 15 says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be caught up. It's that which is corruptible we put off and that which is incorruptible we put on that which is mortal will be put off and and that which is immortal will be put on one day we're going to be changed and one day we're going to be like christ and i look forward to that day but that's a long ways off or it could be tomorrow or t later this afternoon who knows when that will be but we're to live today trying and striving to be holy as he is holy we looked, at, we looked at the work of God in, in making us to, to be acceptable. It, it is the work of Christ. It's what Christ did for us. It's, it's through the witness of the Holy Spirit and, and that seal which seals us until the day that we're fully redeemed. And, and I'm looking forward to what he is going to do for us. But, but Paul here, it's, the, the, the letter here is changing, talking about that work to, to Paul is, is talking about uh, over the next several verses, his prayer for the people at Ephesus. And we need to understand what the people in Ephesus had to do with Paul. In Acts chapter 20, go ahead and turn there if you would with me. Acts chapter 20, we see Paul has actually been in Ephesus a couple of times. In fact, he spent years in Ephesus. He planted the church there. He, 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 he ministered to the people there. And in, in Acts chapter 20, he's traveling through on his, way to, on his way to Jerusalem before he's arrested to go to Rome. And he calls, uh, there, I believe it's verse 19, he calls uh, the people of Miletus, sorry, verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to, to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And he has planted this church. He has ministered to this church. And he's getting ready to, to, to the point where he's not going to see them again. And he knows that. And so he's calling the elders, the, the leaders of the church, to come to him. He wants to sit down and talk to him. It says in verse 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, he says listen, you, you understand how, many, how, how much time I spent here. And, and in fact, later on in the verse says, for three years, he went door to door, house to house, t preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he, he goes on to say that he's free, his hands are free from the blood of all men, and that nothing moved him from that purpose. His, his, he loved the people of Ephesus so much so that he told everybody. There were those that didn't want to hear it, those that, those that, uh, uh, that, that hated him for it, uh, tried to stone him, or they lied in wait, tried to kill him. But there were others who, who heard the gospel, and they got saved. And, and they, they, not only did they hear the gospel, but they began to, to grow. And, and so, so I just wanted you to see his relationship here uh, with the, the, the people uh, of, of, of Ephesus. He says, uh, verse, uh, verse 28 now, he says, sorry, go back to verse 26, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, talking to those, those leaders of the church, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which, hath, which he, Christ, hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that, that after my departing shall grievous woes enter into among you, not sparing the flock, and also of your own selves. Shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember, by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. 
He, uh, he, 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 he loved the people of Ephesus. He, he, he preached the word of God. People got saved. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he was able to claim and say that he was pure, free from the blood of all men because of what he had, of what he had served the Lord there preaching the gospel, not holding anything back. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. Now Paul's writing back to the church at Ephesus. Now he's not visiting. He can't visit. Paul's, this is one of the, the, the prison epistles. Paul is writing from a prison cell. And, and, and now he's writing back uh, uh, to, to the people. And I want you to, 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 to see a few things here. We're going to read a couple of verses. We're going to pray because I'm going to pray and ask God to, to help us this morning and uh, to make sure that we, that we get what he wants for us. Uh, but verse 15 says, Wherefore I also, after I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all, unto all the saints, C cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your word, which, which teaches us, Father. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, which instructs us. God, I pray, Lord, that you would have your way with each one of us this morning. Lord, you know our needs. God, I am asking for you to do a work that I cannot do. Lord, I'm asking you to do a work that none of us can do, Father, uh, but by you. Lord, may, may you have your way with us this morning, and may you be glorified. Lord, may we walk out of here knowing that you were here, Lord, and that you worked. Not, not so that I receive any glory or so that our church does. But, Father, so that you receive glory, so that you are honored and you are praised. We thank you, Father, for all that you'll do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul has just finished talking to them about how they were in Christ, and now he's, he's, he's kind of changing things up. He, he says there in verse 15 and 16 about how he's praying for them, making mention of you in their prayers. It's important that we understand a pastor's prayer for his people. I want you all to know, I pray for you. Because I love you. And I have a desire for God to do something in this place. Now listen, I'm not trying to build myself up. There are a lot of times when we get we get together on Wednesday nights and we take we, we, we take prayer lists. And and we'll have people ask for prayer for, for, for different needs, sometimes physical needs. Sometimes there are those that are sick. We, I mentioned uh, this, this morning, I mentioned, uh, and uh, I'm going to be praying for, for Ganesh Kumar. He's one of our national pastors in India, Zeke's buddy, the, the one who Zeke wanted to leave with when, when they came. He's got COVID, and he's not doing well at all. I got a message from him uh, two days ago asking us to pray. And, in fact, in that, he said that there are thousands that need prayer there. We need to be praying for the people of India, but specifically I'd ask you to pray for Ganesh. Man, God uses him. But, but So sometimes we pray for physical needs, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, the Bible tells us we're to pray for physical needs. When there's one sick among us, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're to pray. Sometimes it, it could be a financial need. Sometimes it could be a, a, a need of a job or a need of, uh, of housing or a need of food. or uh, listen, there, There's many different needs that we could have uh, that, that is okay to ask prayer for. We're, we're to bear one another's burdens. We're to care for one another. We're to be able to come alongside and to help one another. And, and, and I praise the Lord that we, that we can do that. But in this prayer... A pause for the people of Ephesus. I don't read anything. I haven't noticed anything about physical needs. There isn't anything in here where he's praying for their for for their for their health or for their well-being. He's not praying for them to, to, to get a good night's rest. He's not praying for them to, to, to have a good day at work. He's not praying for them to, to he, he he's not praying for any of those things. He's praying instead of their, for their physical well-being, he's praying for their spiritual well-being. And any pastor worth his salt who has a love for the people that God has called him to minister to, and listen, it is a calling. This is not a job, by the, folks. 
It isn't, if you have a pastor who's pastoring a church so that he can get a paycheck, kick him out. If it ever becomes about money, get rid of me and bring in somebody who loves you, who will care for your estate. Paul said of Timothy, he said, I'm sending you Timothy. Bring him in, accept him. Because I have no I have no other man like minded who will care for your estate. See, it's not about a job, it's not about benefits, it's not about those things. A pastor is called to, to be a shepherd, to, to feed the flock, to, to be a blessing, to minister, to, to minister the word of God and to pray. But the greatest things the pastor prays for is not for those financial, those physical needs, those tempor- temporal, temporary things that we think about. Those are the things that consume us. I have never heard somebody ask me, I've never had somebody ask me, hey, will you pray for my child for this? Been very few times, anyways, for their spiritual growth. Will you pray for me for my spiritual growth? I've, had, I've heard a lot of other things. But I want you to know those things are prayed for because God's put those things on my heart. But before Paul could pray, I want you to notice a couple things. We're going to look at it very quickly here. I say quickly. I'm going to try to be quick. I've been given a time limit, so. And you all laugh, just like I did. Paul says in verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. There's a, a, a delightful premise, I guess I would say. There were some things that Paul heard of. There were some things that, that Paul uh, understood uh, that caused him to pray for them. Uh, some, something that, that, that came along that, 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 that Paul heard of and was, he was grateful for, and it, it caused him to pray for the people at Ephesus. The first one is this. Their faith in God. He heard that there was faith in the people at Ephesus. Now, he spent years there. He, he knew these people. He loved these people. But he hasn't been there in a long time. And he's hearing reports of the people at Ephesus. He's hearing how they, how, how, how they, they have faith and that more people are coming to Christ. And listen, if you're going to be a part of the body of Christ, if you're going to be a saint, you have to have faith in God. Without faith, Hebrews 11:6 6 says, it's impossible to please him, please God, for we must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Faith is, is an absolute necessity, faith in God. If you don't have it, you're not saved. You're not a child of God, and you're none of his. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. You must believe that he is. So, ah, I, 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 I think I believe. I think, I, 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 I. There's a difference, by the way, from head knowledge of what the Bible says to placing your faith in something. There's a huge difference. Uh, James, uh, James says that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that Satan and his demons, they believe and they tremble. But they're not saved. There's a saving faith. You know what that comes from? Romans chapter 10, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How shall they call on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, what, what that tells me is that somebody who believes and who wants to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ doesn't just believe that he exists, doesn't just believe that he died on the cross for their sins. They believe and they've called on him. I'm not saying you have to say the, specific, right, the exact right words or even pray out loud, but there needs to be a point in time in your life when you have called on Christ. Please, God, forgive me and save me. I'm not worthy. And you place your faith and trust in Jesus. I'm not saying that somebody has to kneel down beside you and recite you and you recite to them the sinner's prayer. I'm not saying that you have to say the exact right words. I'm saying that your heart needs to cry out to God. And when that happens, the Bible says, Whosoever whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're not saved by your works. You're not saved by becoming a part of a church. You're not saved by, by being a member of something bigger than yourself. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's it. Paul heard of their faith, and he was excited about that. Not only did he hear of their faith, but then he heard of this. Look at at the next next section, 
And the next part of that verse says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. He says, I, I heard not just of your, of your faith, but of your love. I say, well, I thought I'm not saved by my works. You are not. But, but, but if you have experienced the love of God, and if you love God, you'll love those things that God loves. In fact, uh, 1 John tells us that it is a test of our faith. That if we love one another, Jesus said to the disciples uh, back in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but John 13, 35, that, you shall, that they will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. But listen, I'm not, when I say love, I don't mean, I love you, Brother Zach. That's easy. I love you, Brother Rich, no matter how bald you get. Uh, I, 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 I love all you tithers. I don't know who tithes, by the way. No, no, no. It's, a, uh, it's not talking about that kind of love. Let's talk about the kind of love that's sacrificial and brings about service. In fact, look, look at, with me, if you would, at First John. First John chapter 3. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. This is a, a sign that, that we have passed from death unto life, that we have been born again, that we, are, we have a new nature, that we are saved. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we, this is how we see the love of God, or how we can see that it's manifest, because he laid down his life for us. Stop for a second. This is how we know God loved us. Not because he wrote in the Bible, for God so loved the world. But because he sent his son to die on the cross. That's how we know the love of God. And just as God loved us, and God sacrificed himself on that cross, that verse goes on to say, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. He's saying, listen, uh, how, how can you say that you love God and you love the brethren, but you see a brother in Christ and they, they have a need, uh, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether they just need somebody to come alongside of them and be there and minister to them, to, to pray for them. You, you've got that brother that has that need, and you've got the ability to fulfill that need, whether it's financial or whatever, and you say to him instead, be warm, good luck with that, praying for you, how dwell the love of God in him. What Paul was saying in the, back in Ephesians chapter 1 is, he says, listen, I am so thankful I, I've heard of the faith, and I have heard of the love of the brethren, the outflowing, the working out of your faith. Because, listen, our, 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 our faith, when it works in us, changes us. And when we experience the love of God, the love of God outflows through us to love other people. And he goes on to say here, if we don't have that love for, other, for the brethren, then we're not in Christ. Then we're not saved. It's a good test. In fact, that's what it goes on to say. It says, and here by verse 19, we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before, before him. I'm not sure if I'm saved. Do you love the brethren? And not just do you say you love the brethren, but do you love the brethren in deed and in truth? James chapter, see where I wrote it down. James chapter 2.
James chapter 2, we're going to read a few verses here, 14 through 20. It says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now let's stop for a second real quick. I want to make sure you understand what's being said here. We're saved by faith. And from God's view, God can look in your heart and he sees the faith that he's placed there through the word of God. He sees your faith in Jesus Christ. But what did Jesus say? They, not God, they shall know that you're my disciples. How? By your love for one another. How, do man, how does mankind know that we're, that we're the children of God? By the outflowing, by the outworking of the love of Christ. Go back to verse 14, it's not, it's not saying they're not, they're not saved. If, you, if there's not a show of love, but it doesn't look like you're saved without that show of love. I go on there, verse four, or 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth a prophet? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is only one God. How dwell, or how thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? We are not saved by faith or by, by works, but our, our works are an outflow of our faith. Someone says, I got saved, I believe. But nothing ever changes in their life. I can't look in their heart and see whether they meant that prayer that they prayed one day, uh, whether, they, whether, whether they truly got saved or not, but I can tell you from the outside it doesn't look like it. Paul says, I've heard about your faith, the profession of faith, that you trusted in Christ. And I've heard about the love that you have for the brethren. Praise God. The, the, the very basics of Christian, Christianity, that, that, you, that you trust God for salvation through Christ and that you love one another. The very basics of Christianity. That, that, that's, that, and listen, I had somebody come to my office and says, Today, it's say, can we love everybody? I kind of grinned because I knew what we were talking about. It's awful hard in my, in my physical nature, in my flesh, to love everybody. In fact, it's hard for me to like everybody. But the Bible says that I'm to love my wife, that I'm to love my neighbor, and that I'm to love my enemy. It hasn't left anybody out. So can I love everybody? Not on my own, I can't. But through the love of Christ and the work of the Spirit in my life, I can. We're to love one another. These are, these are symbols of, uh, of, of, of the, the, the work of Christ, this love of the brethren. Now, I want you to see what happens next. Not only did he hear of those things, but it caused something in his life. He says that I thank God without ceasing for you. Why? Because you are a part of the body of Christ. You, you are a part of the family of God, and God is working in you, and there is evidence of that. And man, that excites me. It excited Paul. That's what he said back there in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, I cease not to, to give thanks for you. Uh, man, I'm praising God for you. I thank God for what he's doing in you. Wow, it's amazing. Man, I thank God for each and every one of you. I want you to know I am so thankful for our Sunday school teachers. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to start naming names, uh, or even, I shouldn't even name ministries. I am just so thankful for all of you. If you have made a profession of faith, if you have trusted Christ and followed in baptism, if, if, you, if you have, have, have shown evidence of the working of God in you, I am so thankful for what God is doing in you. Not what I did in you. Paul didn't take any of the credit. In fact, I, for most of you, I can't take any of the credit either. For none of you, I can't take any of the credit. Most of you were saved before I even came along. You were part, many of you were part of the church before I was even born. Right, Frank? <laughs> Earl? Rose? She's not here today, but she might be watching from home. 
uh, I, that, that's, that's a, a foundation that somebody else has laid. I'm so thankful for, for what God has done in you and what God continues to do in you. When we, we ask for, fe- for folks to come and help, and, and man, the whole church comes up, praise God! I'm so thankful for what he's doing. I'm so thankful for what God is doing. But uh, with that, I want you to understand, Paul says, I thank God for you, and I pray for you daily because you are a child of his. And he says, I'm not praying for your salvation. And he, you know, doesn't, he, he's not praying for their physical needs. He's not praying for them. He's praying for their spiritual well-being and for their spiritual growth because that's what's truly important eternally. Listen, I, 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 I have been on the end where, I, where, where there was a need, and I was like, Lord, I don't know how this is going to happen, and I've had people pray, and that's necessary, and it's a good thing. But in the end, if, if your tire doesn't get fixed, or your car doesn't get running, or if something happens and you lose your job, you can have all the world, but if you lose or, you're, or you fail in your walk with Christ, you have not accomplished what God has called you to accomplish. In fact, many of the things that God brings us through are there for the purpose of drawing us closer to him. My wife this morning said, last week, I, I, or last year I prayed that, that, that God would give me a closer walk with him. And then she talked about the tra- a tragedy that happened in our family that, that drove her to her knees. She says, be careful what you pray for. As difficult as that, 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 that was, it resulted in a closer walk with God. So we see that, that premise, he's heard of their faith in the Lord. He's le- heard of their love for the brethren. And man, he loves them. And he cares for them, and he, he's thanking God for them. Hebrews 13, 17 tells of, of those who have been given the, the position that Paul has given, a church planter, a pastor, and how the one day that they'll have to give an account. And it's going to be an account of joy or grief. The, that someone who was placed in, 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 under their care either thrived or they starved. Paul says in Philippians, turn over there with me if you would, Philippians chapter 3. Verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me. Remember, he's talking to another church that he started. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. Who mind earthly things. He says, listen, there are those that walked with me. There are those that I've told you of before that, that had made professions of faith. That, that, but, but even now, I tell you, tears streaming down his face as he wrote the words, that, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ, that they've turned their back, that they have left the body. Listen, they, John says they went out from us because they were never of us. And it, it broke his heart. Go on to read those same verses. It says, verse uh, 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Next verse, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the, in the Lord, my dear, the beloved. Paul's prayer for the people at Ephesus, Paul's prayer for the people at Philippi, he, he was thankful for them. He loved them. He called them his joy. And, and, and here it says in Ephesians that he ceased not to give thanks. And in and, and, and Philippians chapter 1, 3, it says, uh, let me read it. 
Philippians 1.3 says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Why? Because he loved them. Because they were a part of the body of Christ. They were a part of the, the ministry that God had called him to. Now in Ephesians, we're going to look for just a moment at what he was praying for. Ephesians chapter 1. Look with me at verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We talked about Paul's delightful premise, why he was praying. He was praying for divine perception. Notice here the sovereign regulation there in the beginning of the verse. He says this, that the God, the God of our Lord and Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give. This gift that Paul's praying for is not something that Paul can accomplish. Paul could not talk them into it. Paul could not teach it into them. Paul could not be the example of it before them. Paul was praying for something that, that only the God could do. And notice he says, he, says, he says, I'm praying that the God, verse 17, the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's, it, it's, a, uh, it's talking about the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He says, he is the God. There's no one else that can do it. No one else that can do this work. You can't get it in a book. You can't wa get it watching a movie. You can't get it from a preacher. You can't get it because, because somebody has come along and, 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 and taught it to you or, or you know, from, some famous, from some famous teacher. Listen, let's look outside of ourselves and outside of this world. He's praying for something only God in heaven can do. the exclusive Godhead, the everlasting glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he might give him something. My prayer and every pastor's prayer for his church isn't for those temporal, temporary things. Yes, we pray for those things, but our greatest prayer is for the spiritual well-being and growth of our church. That God would do something in your hearts. That God would do something in your walk. That God would do something and change you. Hey, listen, the Bible says that, that, he is, that you've been born again, that you have been made acceptable, that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. He has done that work of salvation. But listen, it isn't just about our salvation. It's, it's about so much more. It's about knowing Christ. He says, God, only you can do that. God, this is something that, that only you can do. This is a sovereign regulation. It only comes from God. Secondly, we see this, a self-realization. Then verse 17 says, The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This, this spirit, it's not capitalized. It's not talking about the spirit of God. It, it's talking about an attitude. It's talking about a heart for. He says, so God, what I'm, I'm praying, Lord, is that what you do is you put in their hearts a desire to know you. A desire to, 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 to see you. To, to have you revealed unto them. God, my heart's desire is that they would grow spiritually. That they would grow in their knowledge. That they would grow in their understanding of who you are. And listen, I, can't, I can teach you the word of God, but I can't put that in you. Only God can. 
I read that passage of, uh, of David where he says, as the heart panteth for the water, so does my soul long after you. Listen, we, I can't put that in you, but God can. And my prayer is that every time that you come into this place, every time you open your Bible, every time that you're alone and it's quiet, that, that God puts in you a desire to spend time with him. That when you come here, that you, you come and you, you open these, these songbooks, not just out of tradition, not just because it's the song that we picked, but you want to lift up and glorify God and, and get to know who he is every time you spend time in the word. And if you don't spend time in the word, then you have a hunger for it. Listen, uh, brother, brother Dan mentioned the prayer request this morning, that there are many that were here that struggle finding that time. Listen, we find time for those things that we want. We carve it out. We make it happen. We are busy today. There's, there's, I, it's, it's the, like the more we have uh, the, the things that are supposed to go more quickly, the less time that we have to do it. But can I tell you that it, how important it is to carve out every single day a time to spend with God, a time to open up that word, that, 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 we, could, that we could seek him. Listen, there have been times in my life when I, didn't read the, when I wasn't reading the Bible, and, and, and God would smote my heart. He, I, mean, I would have a hunger for it. I'm like, wow. I, I, I want to do this. It isn't a, a chore, and, and it would lead me to go and grab my Bible, and I'd start to read it, and God would speak to me from it. And listen, we should have a hunger for that. But that's not a hunger that we can fake. You ever tried to eat something when you weren't hungry? Even if it's something that you like, eventually you get sick of it. It's got to be a hunger that God places there. So he's praying for that spirit, the self-realization. It's a pure attitude. And it should cause us to seek after it. See the sovereign regulation, the self-realization, this attitude that has a desire to seek after God. But Paul also prays for the spiritual revelation. The spiritual revelation. Verse 17. And give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He's praying that God would not only give us a desire to know him, but then God would reveal us or reveal himself to us. See, it's, it's okay to try to get to know somebody and have a desire to know somebody. If they don't want to reveal themselves to you, it doesn't matter. I have a desire to, 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 to meet Tom Brady and to get to know him. He has no desire to get to know me. Uh, I, uh, when, uh, I'm thankful that when I met my wife and I had a desire to get to know her, I don't know why, but for some reason she had a desire to get to know me. Right, and so that opened up the the, the communication. The, uh, she was willing to talk to me about things, and I was willing to talk to her about things. And the more we got to know each other, the more that we revealed. And and listen, th there wasn't anything hidden after a while. At least I don't think so. I'm grinning underneath the mask. I'm joking. Listen, Paul says, I'm praying that you would have a desire to know God, and I'm praying that God would reveal himself to you. Out of anything, that is the pastor's first prayer for his people. Not, not for those temporal things, uh, those things are temporary, not for the, the earthly things. And yes, we, we pray for those things, but the most important thing that we could ever pray for is that you would know God. That you would not be satisfied with just your salvation but that God would give you a hunger to spend time in the Word, a hunger to get to know Him. Uh, just like Paul said, Paul said in Philippians, that I might know Him, the, the power of His resurrection, the, the fellowship of His suffering, being made conformable unto His death. Listen, we, we should have a desire and a hunger to know God, and I truly believe if we do, and as Paul prayed, that God would reveal Himself. So how does God reveal Himself to him? A couple of things real quickly and we'll be, we'll be finished. First, God reveals himself to us by the informing world. Psalms 19.1 says that 
The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth the handiwork. You cannot look around this this earth and see the the, the magnificence, and, and not not just the earth, but but everything around it, and, and, and not see the magnificence and the power and the wisdom of an almighty God. God reveals himself to us in this earth. Uh, the, the, even an atheist, uh, while they may deny it, if they, if they follow through, one of my favorite times I ever got to witness to somebody, uh, I was Ubering a, a, a guy. He was a young, a young guy, 25, 26 years old. He saw the Bible in my car, and we started talking. And uh, he was a Christian, so I, didn't, I wasn't really witnessing. I was getting to hear his testimony. He grew up in an atheistic family, and they, they, they talked to him about the evolution all the time. And so he studied it. His parents were both professors. And he followed through, and he took, he goes, I took it to the very end. He goes, everything that they taught, everything that they said, I took it to the very end. And you know what it, it did? It left me with the knowledge that there was somebody that created it all. It didn't just happen. And as he began to seek after that, God revealed himself to him, and he got saved. Praise the Lord. God will reveal himself to us through the word, or through, through the world. Not only that, but we see it. In the inspired word of God. The inspired word of God. Second Timothy chapter two, sixteen says all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. You know how God reveals uh, how God reveals himself to us in this book. Yes, we can see parts about uh, him in this world in this world around us. We can see the, the power. We can see the magnificence. We can see the, the, the mind. It just, it, it, and that, well, the, the truth is we can't, if we would really look into it, it would boggle our minds uh, just all God did in creation. We, we can't even comprehend God, God, which that's what it would bring us to, an incomprehensible understanding that God is bigger and greater and more than anything we, should ever, we can ever know. And it would cause us to stand in awe of that God. But God has also given us his word which doesn't just tell us about his power. It doesn't just tell us about his intelligence. It doesn't just tell us about his design and his ability. What it tells us about is his love and his mercy and his grace and his holiness. We can know God by reading and studying this book. If you want to know God, this is the best place to start. Pick up the book from Genesis to Revelations, and God will reveal himself to you. Even in the stories of the Old Testament, you say, what, is, what does this have to do with who God is? I, every time I look and read something in Scripture, I look at it with two aspects. God, what does this tell me about you? And what does it tell me about me? Because the, God will reveal himself to us in the words of Scripture. Not only does God reveal to us in the words of Scripture, in the inspired word, but he reveals himself to us in the incarnated word. But what is that? Christ. Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. We're right there. Go ahead and turn over to it. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this. Who, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus is the image, the, the icon, the direct representation of the invisible God. God is a spirit. We can't see him. Uh, we can read about him, but we can see Jesus Christ. We can see Jesus Christ, and God reveals himself to us through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you see me, ye have seen the Father. He is the image of God, and we can begin to know God and the things that God reveals to himself in his Son, Jesus Christ. So we should have a desire to get to know the Son. And then there's a, the illuminating witness, and that's the Holy Spirit. John chapter 6, verse 20 says that he, that he testifies of the Father and of Jesus Christ. If we want to know God, that's how we get to know him. By the Word, by the Spirit, by the Son. We should never be satisfied because we got a ticket. And I think that's the fault of the, I think 
one of the problems of the movement over the last in Christianity over the at least here in America over the last several years and I've heard of it being in some other countries as well but we forget that this label this image that God has put upon us means that God is working in us and making us more and more like him too many people have said a prayer and they're they're comfortable when they're in their walk there's never a change there's never a They're a fake. The problem with fakes, they don't pass inspection. There's a show, there's a show that, and then I'll finish with this, there's a show that I was, I was watching here about border security. I don't know, it was on Netflix or something like that. And this guy came in and, and uh, they asked if he had anything to declare and he said, oh, no, no, no. And they're like, okay. And they started going through his bags. And he and his wife had like 30 different purses, like Coach and I don't know what some of the other names are. Um, but none of them were real. They were all fake. And so they're going through and they're going through and, and they're, they're setting all these things aside. And, and he says, I thought you said you didn't have anything. And he says, he said, well, he, he was. those are, we've had those for a long time. We didn't think we had to, and I said, well, no, he was, you have, one, one, you have to declare anything that you purchased to bring back into the U.S. But two, these aren't real. And you knew that when you bought them. If you don't know anything about, if you don't know anything about this, I'll, I'll tell you now, it's illegal to bring that stuff into the United States because it harms the, the economy of the U.S. by bringing that stuff in and then selling the cheap knockoffs to try to make money. It's illegal. You're not allowed to do that. So he, they said, we're going we're gonna to take all this. You're not allowed to take any of it with you. So why, why do you say that? Listen, don't be the knockoff. Jesus says this. There would come a day when there would be those who would go to enter into the kingdom of heaven and God would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And they said, but Lord, we did all these things in your name. And he said, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. And like, when did we ever see you? He says, well, you did to the, to the least of these, my brethren. You did unto me. It's easy to say that we love one another. As a part of the child, as a, as a part of the body of Christ, we that's a that's a showing that we're saved, that we love one another. If we're saved and we love one another, don't just stop there. But, but but may God give us a hunger to grow in our knowledge of Him. May we get to know Him better and better. Every time we open the Bible, every time we come to church, may may it be our heart's desire not just to be there, but to to know Him. Coming in, seeking God, Lord, what can you show me today? How can I come to know you better today? God, I need, I want to know you today. Help me, Lord. It's not what we can do. It's not what, listen, I can get up here and I can preach and I can do it every single week and nothing ever change if our hearts aren't open to it and if we're not looking for it. And it doesn't matter if it's me or if it's Paul or Apollos or Mark Thren or Charles Spurgeon or any other preacher you can think of, if we don't have a desire and a hunger to know God will not seek him out. And that's part of the pastor's prayer. Praying for you to have a hunger to know the Lord. God help us. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word and the, the example that Paul has given to us, Lord, these truths. Lord, I'm thankful for each member of our church, Lord, each one that's saved here today. Lord, just thankful for the work of Christ in their life. Lord, the evidence of salvation and, and their, their love of you and their service of one another. Uh, God, I pray for them. Hey, Lord, if there's one here today that maybe they'd examine their heart and, and Lord, you've shown them that, uh, that 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 love isn't real or there is no love or that, that knockoff, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they come to Christ. Lord, I pray for those that, that are here, Lord, that they would just have a hunger, Lord, be seeking to know you better, even this morning. Lord, may they pray that for themselves. May they pray it for one another. 
But God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Keep your heads bowed, nice close, just for a moment. If you're here today and you're not saved, the Lord's maybe laying it upon your heart, you're not sure of your salvation, I'd encourage you, just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Is there anybody at all? You're not sure where you would spend eternity. If that is you, God loves you since the die of the cross for your sins. And he wants, he wants to know you. He wants to save you. You can reach out at any point in time. Grab me after the service. And give me a phone call, send an email, whatever. But I'd love to show, show you the word of God. How you can know him. If you're here today, just, you've been struggling in your walk, struggling in your life, maybe you go through a dry period. Seems like God's far away. You raise your hand just so I can pray for you. A couple of hands up. The Bible says, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. May God help us. Father God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word and the, the truth that we can find in it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, uh, those that raise their hand, for just that they, they, they know that there's a a, a, it feels like there's a distance between them and you, Lord. I pray that you would just work in their hearts to draw them to you, Father. Um, you might be glorified in, in how you work in them. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray, God, that you would give us a desire to know you better. Lord, a hunger to, to dig into your word and to, to have, uh, have that relationship with you uh, that, that as we walk with you. God, I pray that you would uh, strengthen us as a, as a body of believers. Uh, help us to love one another and to honor and glorify you in all that we do, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.